Hello there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. So the Pixel 8 and the Pixel 8 Pro are now available, which means we've been able to take a bit of a deep dive to find out about the new Tensor G3. What is it made of? What's on the inside? Also take a look at some of the performance for both CPU and GPU and including looking at the sustained performance. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at the new Google Tensor G3 processor. But before we get started, it is worth mentioning a few things that Google have said just to give them their dues before we start talking about CPU performance and GPU performance. Google is saying it's not about speed or traditional performance metrics. Our work with Tensor has never been about speed or traditional performance metrics. It's about pushing the mobile computing experience forward. It includes our next generation TPU, which was custom designed to run Google's AI models. Compared to the first generation of Tensor on the Pixel 6, our latest phones run more than twice as many machine learning models on device. The models themselves are also more sophisticated. That's a massive jump in a short time, and it means that machine learning models now enhance just about every aspect of the Pixel user's experience. So they are emphasizing, as they have done with the previous generations of the uh, Tensor processor, the Tensor name gives gives it away, it's about the NPU, the neural processing unit, not necessarily about traditional performance uh, metrics. However, they do say in their press release, it includes the latest generation of ARM CPUs, upgraded GPU, new DSP and new imaging DSP. So if it does have the latest generations of ARM CPU and an upgraded GPU, let's see what performance you get out of them. Now, if you remember back in June of 2023, I made a video talking about that the Tensor G3 will be a nine core processor. That was the information that we had received over at Android Authority via a leak. And that is what I based this video on. And it is indeed a nine core processor. We often had uh, eight core processors. There's a few six core processors. We had a 10 core processor. To memory, and I could be wrong, but this is the first nine core uh, processor. So what do we get? Well, here's the G3 in this left-hand column. Here's the G2. Here's the G1. So you've got one ARM Cortex-X3, up to 2.91 gigahertz. And then after that, you get four Cortex-A715, clocked at 2.37 gigahertz. And then you get another four cores, making it nine in total, the Cortex-A510 clocked at 1.7 gigahertz. Now compare that to the other ones in the in the previous generations, it was a two plus two plus four setup, so making eight cores in total, two X1s, two A78s, two A55s, and then the G1 we had two X1s, two A76s, and then two A55s. So the, the G3 is a completely new CPU setup. Okay, so it's no longer two plus two plus four, it's now one plus four plus four. We've gone to the X3, jumping over the X2 completely. We've gone to the A715. We've gone to the A510. Big upgrades from the A55, from the A78, from the A76, and so on. Now, if you want to know more about all these different processor names, the Cortex X3, the Cortex A, I do have videos about all of these, all the way back to the A76 uh, and the X1, everything, all on my channel here, so you can go and find those. Now, looking at the GPU, we've got the Mali G715 that was launched at the same time as the A715, and we estimate that it's an MP7. Now, why are we saying that? Well, the point is this is not an Immortalis. Now, the Immortalis, if you watch my videos on the Mali GPUs, you can only be kidding called Immortalis if it's got a certain number of cores and if it supports hardware ray tracing. This has less cores than it needs to be called Immortalis. So we think it's just a normal Mali G715, not an Immortalis. Seven uh, cores. This is basically similar to what you had the year before, the Mali G710 MP7, so it came the same. And of course the G2 had a big uh, upgrade compared to the Mali G78 MP20. And Talking about the process node, five nanometers, five nanometers for the previous ones. Now we're on Samsung's four nanometer. My understanding is this is their first generation of their four nanometer one, not their second generation. It does seem that the second generation will be reserved for the new Exynos processor that's coming out. Now, how does this compare to what else is on the market? Well, again, here we've got the G3 in this left-hand column. The A17 Pro, which I've done a couple of videos about, just came out recently, is a hexa core. So you've got two high-performance cores clocked. Look at this, 3.78 gigahertz compared to 2.91 gigahertz. So a massive uh, clock frequency there. And then it's only got the four energy-efficient cores, again, clocked to 2.1 gigahertz compared to 1.7. You've got Apple's GPU with hardware ray tracing and built on TSMC's three nanometers. So this is the most advanced processor 
uh, at the time of making this video. And then of course you've got the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, which has also has the Cortex X3. It's also got four uh, middle cores here, A715 and A7110. Uh, Qualcomm did that to maintain 32-bit compatibility, which you can actually get in this one here, but there's a few markets in the world where everything hasn't yet moved over to 64 bits. And then you've got three Cortex A510. So the difference is here is they've got three here rather than the four here. So that's, that would make this a nine core one if they did that, but they went with three to keep it at eight, but do notice it's clocked at two gigahertz. And of course the Adreno 740 GPU, which also has hardware ray tracing and built on TSMC's four nanometer process. And then just to round it off, we also have here the A16 Bionic. That was a five core GPU, different CPU architecture. Again, 3.46 gigahertz, so pretty fast there, even for the previous generation. And the Dimensity 9200, uh, a more traditional one plus three plus four setup, similar kind of process here, X3, 715, A510, but of course this is an octa-core rather than a nine-core. And you've got the Mali G715 Immortalis, and notice the Immortalis there, hardware ray tracing and the 11 core. So this one doesn't have enough cores, and they're not saying it's got hardware ray tracing. TSMC's four nanometer for both of those. Okay, so let's go and have a look at our first bit of benchmarking. This is Geekbench 6 single core. Now this is just the Pixel phones. So you've got the Pixel 6 Pro, the 7 Pro, now the Pixel 8 and the Pixel 8 Pro. And as you can see here, a steady growth of the single core scores. What's interesting here, and we're gonna see this reflected a lot of the things, is that the Pixel 8 Pro seems to have better uh, cooling, better thermals, which means it's allowed to push the CPU harder. So these, both of these have the G3. This one seems to be running uh, certainly a bit faster. So you get a 10% increase in performance compared to the G2. And in fact, 23% performance increase compared to the G2 if you have the Pro version of the Pixel 8 and an 11% increase compared to just the normal Pixel 8. So definitely there is some higher performance in the bigger device with better thermals. If you take that as the overall landscape of what's going on, the pixels are at here at the lower end. Just the uh, Dimensity 9200 does beat the Pixel 8, doesn't beat the Pixel 8 Pro. And then after that, you've got the, uh, the Samsungs uh, with the uh, you know the Samsung S23 Ultra, for example, with the Snapdragon 8 G2, and then the iPhones that are way ahead here. So we can see definitely an improvement over the previous generations, but they're not catching what the competition is offering in terms of just the CPU performance. We really emphasize that Google said they don't aim for that, they're aiming for what they can do with their uh, onboard AI models. Now, if we switch to multi-core, again, we can see an increase over the generations and uh, again, 18% better in the G3 in the Pixel 8, but actually 23% better compared to the G2 if you go with the 8 Pro, again, better cooling, uh, about 4% better than the normal Pixel 8. So basically the Pixel 8 Pro is the better of the two in terms of raw performance. Uh, and that's mainly because of the thermal properties. And again, if you look at that in the overall scale of things, pretty much the same picture. Dimensity 9200 uh, is well, just under what you can get with the Pixel 8 now for multi-core. Of course, this is of course a nine-core processor. This is an eight-core, this is a nine-core processor. The Pixel 8 Pro better still, but still the uh, Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 in the Samsung and the iPhones are still ahead in, in multi-core scoring as well. Now, what about graphics? Well, we've got that uh, that G715, Mali G715. So you can see there's a big improvement over what was in the previous generation. So that's good news. And here the cooling of the Pixel 8 Pro doesn't seem to do very much. The scores for all the graphics I'm going to show you now are basically the same for the Pixel 8 and the Pixel 8 uh, Pro. So basically that's a 32% increase in performance compared to the Tensor G2 in the Pixel 7 Pro. And again, if you look at the overall landscape, noting here that for 3D Mark Wildlife, the uh, the uh, Dimensity 9200 and the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 both do very, very well compared to the iPhone and compared to what you get in the Tensor G3. So definitely the winner there. Uh, that's a slightly different when you come to Wildlife Extreme. That's a different benchmark, harder, the extreme version. Snapdragon still doing very, very well. Beats the, AI, the A16 in the iPhone 14 Pro. However, the A17 Pro in the new iPhone 15 Pro just seems to beat the uh, Snapdragon there. 
And overall, again, here we can see a 32% increase in performance compared to the G2. Now, when it comes to stress testing, this, is, of course, is a very interesting uh, picture. So what have we got? This blue line here is the Samsung Galaxy 23, S23 Ultra. And as you can see, it's certainly the best for many, many runs here. Five, six, seven, eight runs. It does very well. You can see the iPhones start off a little bit lower than the Samsungs are, but they're fairly straight line. Not, there is a dip, but it's not as pronounced as let's say you get in the S23. And then here we can see the Google Pixel 8. The 8 Pro isn't on this graph. I'll show you that in a moment. And here you can see the previous pixels as well. So there, there's, a, there's a decline there. So what you can say here, once you get into over 10 runs, so you're doing a, several minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of gaming, let's say, then you're going to get all the Samsung and the iPhone are all going to offer you basically the same performance. After all the thermals kick in, all that heat needs to be dispersed. Things start to slow down because it can't generate more heat. It would be too hot in the hand. It would be uncomfortable. So you're basically get the same performance. And here, when it comes to the Google uh, devices, basically, of course, the 8 Pixel 8 is much better than the previous generations. However, of course, you do still have that quite sharp uh, decline. In fact, if you look at that point there and you go across, you know, the, the after throttling, you're getting less than what you get at the beginning with the previous generation. That's just the way it is. Now let's look at what happens if we add the Pixel 8 Pro. Now this is only with the Pixel devices and no Samsung or Apple device here. This white line here now is the Pixel 8 Pro. And as you can see, clearly much, much better. So that's that thermals kicking in again. Different thermal budget, bigger device, better at what it at the cooling. So you don't get nowhere near as rapid decline. So it's able to stay much, much uh, performant over a longer time. So again, if you're into uh, long time playing game, not just casual games that you play for two, three minutes while you're waiting for the bus or something, but you like to sit down for a good hour and play some gaming on your Android device, then you might want to consider the Pixel 8 Pro just because it's going to offer that more consistent performance. So there you have it, the Tensor G3 in the Pixel 8 and the Pixel 8 Pro. If you'd like to see the written article that accompanies this video, the link to it is in the description below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think about the Tensor G3, what you think about the Pixel 8 and the Pixel 8 Pro. Do let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. And if you like these type of videos, then why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.